Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we do indeed thank you for your word, the word of life. But above all, we thank you for your word made flesh. Even Jesus, who humbled himself, the one who is now exalted at your right hand and ever lives to make intercession for us. Help us to hear his word today and to follow him obediently. For his name's sake we pray. Amen. I'm glad that you are having a look at Philippians during the course of this month. It's a great letter and there's so much that we can learn from it, be encouraged by it. And I believe that God is really wanting to speak to us all as we have a look at chapter 2 this, uh, this morning. Of course, the focus of chapter 2 is very much on Jesus. Jesus, in all his wonderful power and majesty, his humility, his grace, that enabled him to obey and to come and to be made like one of us to identify with each of us and then to take that place of the servant, the one who humbled himself and died the death of a criminal, crucified, and then wonderfully having accomplished the work that he'd been sent to do broke out from the grave and is now exalted at the right hand of the Father. He lives to make intercession for you and me and one day he's coming again. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is indeed the Lord. There is none other. He is the emperor, the king. He is the one to be served and honored. And this is the picture that Paul gives to us of Jesus himself. But Paul also speaks to us not just of Jesus as we look up to him but also of looking around among each other and then as we look out towards the world. So in a sense I'm wanting to divide it into three parts and yet to see there's a, there's a oneness, there's a, there's a sort of wholeness about it that when everything is happening as intended then there's a uh, a release of God's presence and power to accomplish what he intends. I suppose in some sense we can divide the world into two camps. You may think of all sorts of different uh, divisions you might want to, to, to consider. I'm going to consider the camp that loves football and the camp that hates football. And for those who have any understanding of that game, you will realize that this week has been a somewhat different week and a somewhat special week. And especially if you happen to be a supporter of Liverpool or Tottenham Hotspur. Maybe there are some here who, who are. But even if you're not, there's something rather wonderful, isn't there, about rescuing a situation out of nothing at all and seeing a group of people so functioning together that they actually win 
when it looks as though they're going to lose. And I felt that that was, in a way, a picture of the church, of how it is actually possible to become united and become so uh, filled, as it were, with the Spirit that we can actually function in a way that provides victory. That's what's intended. And I think particularly when I was, uh, I never watched it, but I, I heard about and read about it, about the, 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 the Liverpool match, that there was an amazing coming together of the team, the manager, and the crowd, the fans. And indeed, all were needed in order to provide that mix that uh, produced the result that in fact took place. And of course, if you're a Tottenham Hotspur fan, it all happened again, more or less, uh, the following day. You see, there's a sense in which when we, by God's Spirit, can get it together, then something starts to happen. I'm going to take as a focus, not so much the the, the amazing hymn that we've already looked at from verses uh, 6 to 11, but verse 13. It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Or as it says in the New Living Translation, God is working in you, giving you the desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him. God gives the desire to obey and the power to do what, he, what pleases him. In order to do this, there's no doubt that first of all we need to look up to get at such a vision of Jesus, such an awareness of who he is, that he is the one who has died, who has risen again, who is glorified, and who is coming again. He is indeed our champion. He is the one who brings salvation. He is the one who is the director of our lives. He is, if you like, our manager. And we want to please him. We want to do whatever we can in order to serve him. So the first thing we need to do, having looked up, is to look around. Because we are part of a community. A community of people here at St. Helens. You worship together on a Sunday morning. Some of you meet together in home groups. There's a sense of recognizing one another and that you are part of a family and as a family you have responsibilities to one another but more than that we're not just a local community or even a community of churches here in Hastings but we are a worldwide fellowship the body of Christ throughout the world the body of Christ that is often suffering for his sake. The body of Christ that is going through conflict because they are loyal to Jesus. And so Paul begins this uh, chapter, if any of you has any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, make my joy complete, he says, by being like-minded and having the same love being one in the spirit and one in mind Paul recognizes that just because we happen to be Christians it doesn't mean to say that we necessarily uh, come together in a chemistry that enables us to act and to be in a way that is going to be effective 
Those teams that were successful at their football matches this week were only successful, one, because they had a good manager, secondly, because they trained together, and they were able to uh, understand one another, trust one another, realize that they weren't a bunch of individuals, but were actually moving together so that they could provide the result that, in fact, gave victory. And it's the same for us within the church. We are together. But, of course, the problem is <laughs> that we tend to be selfish, that's our sort of default position as human beings. I was, um, I, we, we've, Holy Trinity, we've just started a course on discipleship, and the, we had our first group on, on Wednesday evening. And uh, it was talking about ordinary people like you and me uh, being reflecting the glory of God. After all, we're made in his image, but also that we're full of garbage as well. The glory and the garbage. The good and the bad. You know, there's such a mix. And what the Spirit is doing in you and me is actually changing us so that we are being changed from one degree of glory to another. He's having his work. That, that work is going on. Do you allow him to do that? Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Is that a word that you and I need to take on board today? If we're going to be looking out for one another. Not looking at your own interests, but each of you looking to the interests of others. For Paul recognized that when he was writing this letter, just as would be true today, Verse 21, everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. May God help us to be those who are caring for others, even when it hurts, even when it costs. Indeed, if we consider what Jesus has done for us, what he gave up, how he didn't cling on to being equal with God, something to be used for his own advantage, but made himself nothing, then he caused you and me to follow a similar route, to recognize that we ourselves are part of a team that is here to serve him, that we may be there, as it were, in the vanguard when he, when he returns, so that we can say, great, here is the one to whom every knee will bow and every tongue, including ours, is going to say eagerly, Jesus is Lord. He is the master of my life, and I know and love him. We need to look out for one another and to serve one another, to be concerned for each other's interests. That is a hallmark of a local church. It's also the hallmark of the worldwide church. And it's lovely to see Salik here today, back from, uh, from Pakistan. Part of the worldwide church, as we acknowledge that we are indeed simply a tiny microcosm of what God is doing today. And thinking of uh, Pakistan, we rejoice that... Uh, a uh, oh, I forgot her name's gone out of my mind. Uh, yeah, thank you. Has actually now in, uh, in Canada. And uh, we give thanks to God for that. Remembering our brothers and sisters who are in mortal danger because they confess Jesus is Lord. We look for their interests. We pray for them. We seek to encourage them in any way we can. Looking up, looking round, but looking out, looking out into the world, recognizing the sort of place this is. It is not nice, but we are called to be children 
who are blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Did you think this was the first time this was a warped and crooked generation? You're wrong. It's always been like that. The, 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 the warps and the crookedness have just varied a bit from generation to generation. But it is the church of God that is called to be different, to care, to be there to serve, and to give ourselves to others as well. I was at a conference uh, earlier this, this week in which um, a, a lovely couple were being interviewed, David and Jessica Oluelo. David is a, an actor and so is his wife. And they're wonderful Christian people. He, was the, um, he, he, he played the part of Martin Luther King in the, in the film Selma. And again, in, he, he was featuring in uh, Les Miserables recently on the television. And what struck me particularly was, was this, that when they were planning to get married, they, they, they'd met at drama school some, some years ago. And uh, they'd been married, I think it's 20 years now, something like that. And when, when they were planning to get married, uh, Jessica's agent said to her, well, of course, you won't be changing your name, will you? And she says, yes, I'm going to change my name. Um, I'm going to take the name Oluelo, my husband's name. And, and he said, well, I wouldn't do that if I were you, because you know your marriage will never last. And she said, well, that's a challenge for you then, isn't it? And they've got four lovely children. And they seek to prioritize family commitment even in the midst of the, the, the film industry and the acting uh, world. You see, it is possible to be a bright light, as Paul mentions here, in a world like, then, like that. You will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. That is what it's all about as we look outwards to the world, shining as stars in the sky, so that they see the light that is in us and glorify God. That's what witnessing is all about. That as we're out there in the world, whether we're speaking or doing, whatever it may be, then others will see that there is a difference and be attracted to the light. It's interesting that this whole area of witness, both in terms of looking around at others, but also looking outwards, was something that Paul himself uh, was appreciative of, because the Philippians had sent Epaphroditus, who was one of their leaders, to go and minister to Paul. They probably brought some. He probably brought a monetary gift. He was in prison in Rome, and so he sets out on this uh, journey. Not an easy journey, crossing the, uh, crossing the Adriatic and uh, crossing, uh, going ac across uh, Italy to get to Rome. And then when he gets there, he falls ill, almost dies. And then Paul says in writing his letter, I'm going to send Epaphroditus back to you. He's so appreciative of what he's done. But I'm going to send Timothy as well. So that he can encourage you spiritually so that he can minister to you. And I'm hoping to come along too, God willing. And maybe he did on Paul's fourth missionary journey, which isn't actually specifically mentioned in the scriptures. But the thing is that they were going out to help one another, realizing what they had been given, and so that they were able to, to enhance their ministries. This is part of what it's all about. We're not lone workers in some sort of lonely place, but rather we are part of a team, a team that is seeking to serve God, whether it's in the practical things of some of the issues that go on here, even in the town, street pastors, food bank, uh, so many other ways, soup kitchen, ways in which we can serve others in a practical way and be lights in the world. 
I was reading a report just recently that had come through from the, uh, from the um, primates, the archbishops that gathered together recently that, uh, representing the, the GAFCON, the Global Anglican Fellowship, largely from Africa and Southeast Asia and other places. And they said this, as a global fellowship, we are uniquely positioned to support one another in ministry to a world where mass immigration and globalization are reshaping our countries. In this new world, every believer has a role in preaching Christ faithfully to the nations. In many situations, the main challenge is not ignorance, but unbelief. And we ask you to join us in prayer for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit's power to break into the hearts and minds of those who have not yet believed. And I think Paul would want to say to us today as we study this chapter, brothers and sisters, the opportunities out there are immense. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. He is there to empower and to equip you in order that you may complete the task that he has given to you. Don't be discouraged. Lift up your eyes. Look to him and you'll be amazed at what the Spirit will do for you. God is working in you. Giving you the desire to obey him and the power to do what pleases him. Do you have the desire somewhere in your heart to serve him? Does it need to be motivated a bit more? Well, he will give you that increased desire to serve him so that we can actually get out there and start doing. Are you fearful that somehow if you did that you wouldn't be able to achieve anything? You sort of fall flat on your face. No, he says, you have the power I will give you the power to do what pleases me. That is the promise that is given. So as we consider this amazing chapter, let's give thanks to God for all that he has given to us, supremely in our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us everything that we need. We thank him that there's a goal and that is the return of Jesus, that one day he will come back, one day every knee will bow. But he's given to us a task, a task to look after one another and to go out as lights in the world, stars among a generation that is skeptical and unbelieving, that they too may have an opportunity of seeing the light. And he will give us the desire to obey him and the power to undertake what he gives us to do. That's so encouraging. May we indeed look afresh at God's word. Consider this very chapter and know that he is there to empower you and me for our calling. May God indeed bless and equip us by his Holy Spirit. Amen.